Many people came to America because of its religious tolerance. Today, we'll be looking at a variety of faiths. We're gonna make a calf's brain, black butter and capers. We're making a fantastic beef royale, which is a roast sirloin that gets rolled with uh, fried oysters and anchovies, very unique, and mushroom ragu. We're gonna make red beans and wine, and mashed potatoes with bacon and onion. In the 18th century, Philadelphia was truly a city of brotherly love, and our inspiration for today's Taste of History. One of my favorite religious leaders was Bishop White. After all, his congregation was stuck with all kinds of people of absolute importance, such as modern George Washington, Betsy Ross. We're going to honor Bishop White with the first recipe, which is a veal brain that is uh, sautéed in butter and capers. No question, calf's brain might be sound strange. It's no longer in style in, without today's diet. However, in the 18th century, it was one of the many dishes always served, including tongue, and feed and many other things that we right now look as byproducts. What you gotta do when you buy it from your butcher, you have to soak it, lay it in, uh, in water, and change the water frequently. And what happens is the brain has a membrane that runs through it. And what you wanna make sure, you wanna take your, uh, your hand in between and make sure that you, you, you remove this membrane carefully, just like so. You take an onion and you make a very simple, straightforward onion piquet. Today I'm lucky I have fresh bay leaf. You don't get them all the time, but they have much more flavor. All I'm gonna do is put the, the clove in to hold it in. I have a pot on my fire. I'm gonna put the onion piquet in it. Salt. And now I'm gonna bring the brains, add it in the water and keep it at a very low simmer. It takes about 10 minutes or so. Gently add it in. We're going to let it sit in the stock to simmer, like 10 minutes or about. Afterwards, later when we serve up the meal, all we got to do is fry it, some capers and black butter, and the dish is served. So now I'm going to make my beef stock really quick because I need it later to finish the dish. So I have a, a dachi on the fire. I'm going to bring it right here to my landing. A little oil in here. I take some neck bones and a little bit of a leg bone. You're gonna to have to make a serious uh, beef stock. So now I'm gonna put this back in the fire. Once the bones get a little uh, colored on both sides, I add in a mirepoix, which is basically nothing more than onions, carrots, some celery. So then they're deglazing with red wine a bunch of times. Top it off with stock, and it gives me later the beef stock that I need to make the very, very special mushroom sauce that goes on the bottom of the uh, beef royale. In 1790, George Washington wrote to a Jewish congregation in Newport, Rhode Island that, the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. Yet in that same year, non-Christians were still barred from voting in public office in most states. Although Mayflower Puritans came to New England to escape religious persecution, they detested and mistrusted anyone who wasn't of their faith. While Quaker William Penn started his Pennsylvania colony based on religious freedom, in practice, the colonies were a work in progress when it came to tolerance. Colonial Philadelphia offered a smorgasbord of faiths living side by side. Philadelphia was chock full of denominations. Right here behind us is the old first reformed church. Right down 4th Street was Zion Lutheran Church, which served the German community, was the largest church in the city, and was the place where the congressional memorial service for George Washington was held after his death. So we have this great intersection of faith right here. With the brains, you got to be very careful. It's just a very gentle poach. Otherwise, they would fall apart on you. It's a gentle dish to begin with. You want to make sure that you don't overcook it. 
As far as the bones is concerned, all you want to do is give it some good heat. Give some good heat on it. I'm going to go in here and add the mirror to it. I have an aggressive money ahead of me, so I want to be very careful. I'm going to take the springs off the fire and just set it next to the fire. Now, if you want to follow this recipe at home, the stock that I'm making is really not important. With the amount of mushrooms that goes as a base, any store-bought demi-glass would do the trick. So don't worry about that, but I just want to show you the right way. The main course we're making today in honor of Bishop White is a strip line that uh, looks like so. And what we're going to do to it, we're going to just cut a piece off and make sure that we have a big enough piece to fit in my pot. Each animal only has two strip lines, so you know it was expensive then as it's expensive now. This is when you go to a restaurant, you ask for a New York strip steak, this is what you're going to get. I'm going to leave the fat cup on here, but I'm going to take, there's a big uh, wind through here, I'm going to take that off. Here yeah, like so. All I got to do now, Take a little bit more, trim the fat down a little bit. You want some fat on it for the flavor. Like so. Now comes the most important part. It's the seasoning of this piece. We're gonna have some salt and pepper. Good amount. Salt, pepper. Pepper. This is actually what we're going to call later pan roasting. It does not go in the oven. It actually literally gets cooked on the stove in a pan. Nutmeg. Nutmeg. And the most important and maybe the most expensive part and the most difficult part to find maybe not in the 18th century but now is the maize. And maize is the outside membrane of the nutmeg which has a distinct different flavor. So you cannot compare this with the flavor of the actual nutmeg. Here we go. So you hear me say it gets cooked in the oven. So what you want to do, you want to have a dachi, and I mean hot. You put some butter in it for this dish. Put it in the, in the, in the dachi. Sear it off on both sides. And then it goes on the fire. In the 18th century, with grass-fed beef only, they would lard it. So if you find a recipe that does the same dish, they may infuse some lard into the meat. Today's marbled meat, you don't need it, but you could. Swedish immigrants came to America in the 1600s. One of their oldest churches is right here in Philadelphia, an old city. Many people came to America for religious freedom. The Swedes came here for a completely different reason. Old Swedish church dates back to 1646, and it's the oldest church in Pennsylvania. The Swedes did not come here for religious reasons. They came because they were looking for an economic miracle. On this property, the first building was built, which at that point was outside the bounds of Philadelphia because William Penn did not want to put his colony right where all the Swedes were settled. So he had to go a little further up the Delaware. So the Swedes got here before William Penn? Oh yes, in fact, many of the Swedes who lived here served as his interpreters when Penn came and they modeled his peaceful relationship with the Indians, a way in which Europeans and Native Americans could live together in peace. All right, I got a spider on the fire, a little bit of butter. I'm gonna add in some very finely chopped bacon. Now, if you uh, don't wanna have bacon in your red beans, it doesn't really make a difference. There's so much flavor from the red wine in there, but it just adds additional flavor to it. I have some onions I already chopped. And so all I want to do now is get that, make the onion translucent. You could actually put the onions and the bacon right into the beans, omit this step, but I just think it's much better flavor, and I'm sure Bishop White was used to have it the right way. All right, the red beans are pre-blanched. Almost done. Now I'm gonna bring the bacon and the onion of the fire. Make sure it don't burn. And add it into my mixture. See, and that's what I was talking about, the flavor when you saute the onion and the bacon together. It's just better. You might find recipes that don't do that, but don't be fooled. 
Now comes the connection with Burgundy, and this is a lot of Burgundy wine goes in here. So once the beans are blanched, it doesn't get any water. What it does, it just gets red wine. Just take a time. A couple of bay leaves go in there, just like so. I'm going to check really quick on salt, because when you blanch something, sometimes the, the salt changes. Let me see. Oh, very good. Just need a little pe pepper. Now it goes back in the fire, and our legume for the main course is basically done. Now is a good time to check on our strip loin. Let's see if it's cooking away. Oh yeah, beautifully. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So now we'll take the brain out of the poaching liquid and let it kind of chill. The reason for that is I want to be able to sit up for a little bit. It's kind of important. Bishop White was the chaplain of the First Continental Congress, but he also threw some fantastic parties. This is Christ Church, established 1695. When William Penn declared that there would be religious liberty in Pennsylvania, the king who granted his charter didn't quite believe him and put into the charter that if 36 Anglicans wanted a Church of England parish, there was to be one and that those Anglicans could worship unmolested in the king's words. This was no ordinary church. It was a, a worship home of many founding fathers. Benjamin Franklin, George and Martha Washington sat in the president's pew. These are graves in the floor and the one here in the chancel is of the right Reverend William White, who was rector of Christ Church. Anglican clergy had a problem during the revolution. They took an oath of allegiance to the king. We, of course, had no king no longer. This is the English prayer book of 1662 and is the prayer book that was used in all Anglican churches in the colonies here and around the world. And on July 4th, he scratched out all of the prayers for the king and royal family and replaced those references with prayers for those in civil authority. Come on in, Walter. I want to introduce you to Bishop William White and talk a little bit about the room we're in, his parlor. This room of the bishops, this parlor, is really quite a comfortable space. This was a family space that the family would have used during the day. And it's also an entertaining space. Bishop White's relationship with his parishioners and his community would have carried from him standing in the pulpit at Christ Church to him sitting at this tea table drinking with friends. I mean, he's always the rector of Christ Church, the most prominent clergyman in Philadelphia. Now I'm going to add some carrots to my beans and wine. It's good for color and also the sweetness of the carrot helps the flavor. And those ones will cook by maybe five, ten minutes and they're done. As soon as the red wine cooks down a little bit because the beans were already pre-blanched. I gotta fry some oysters in a bit. I'm waiting for the oil to get hot. So in the meantime, I'm gonna get my potatoes, Yukon Golds that I use, and bring them over to finish the smashed potato. The smashed potatoes I'm making for Bishop White are a little unique in that he used lard. And lard was an inexpensive eater. So lardons go right in there, shallots go in there, Sour cream goes in there, and chives. And it all gets mixed up together, a little salt, a little pepper, and it's a great way to eating a potato. You can use Yukons or Irish whites. So the lardon goes in now. Gives a nice flavor afterwards. Shallots, whole shallots, by the way, never cooked. Sour cream, a good amount. All right, all we're gonna get now is some nutmeg. Smash it up, keep it warm on the fire until we're ready to make the main course, which is gonna be soon. And now we're gonna smash them up, hence for the name smash versus mash. Once the bottom melts, I'm gonna add some capers into it. Let's recap a bit. I fry the oysters that I need for the stuffing that you will see later. Right now I wanna finish the brains with the capers, the smashed potatoes I already made, the red beans are equally cooked, and the meat is roasting away. Now it just comes in a moment the assembly of the mushroom ragu, that's the base for the meat.
We need to thank Thomas Jefferson, my hero, for maintaining religious freedom in America. While Protestants tried to proselytize to their African-American slaves, it was the lively worship services and evangelical revivals of the Methodists that was most familiar and appealing to black Americans. Mother Bethel was actually founded as a result of what was called the segregated pew. Pews that once were inclusive became segregated. And as Richard Allen said, he wanted a place where he can worship under his own vine and fig tree. They put the building up and dedicated it in 1794, and uh, we've been worshiping on this piece of land ever since, which makes us the oldest continuously owned parcel of land uh, held by African Americans. The first design of the Seal of the United States was recommended by Franklin, Jefferson, and Adams in 1776. It depicted the biblical scene of Jews crossing the parted Red Sea with the motto, Rebellion to Tyrants is Obedience to God. In this case is the famous correspondence between Moses Satius representing the Jewish community of Newport and George Washington, the first president of the United States. Moses Satius used that phrase to bigotry no sanction and Washington, as he did in many of his correspondence, kind of picked up on that golden nugget. So Washington writes that this will be a government which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. And he actually ends his letter by talking about every man shall sit safely under his own vine and fig tree. In 1787, Jefferson's work was influential as the Constitution and then the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights finally made it official in 1791. Religious tolerance was the law of the land. And now, the chanterelle mushrooms are too delicate. You wouldn't want to chop them up. They're just absolutely gorgeous. I put them right in there. I have some uh, porcini. A little bit of flavor that come together. All we need, but mushroom in here. Salt. The most expensive mushroom in the world, but Bishop White, the parishioners paid for it. <laughs> I'm gonna chop that. Now I put rainwater Madeira in here. Beef marrow is the last ingredient that goes in it. We just want to chop it. Beef marrow. And all it's going to get is a little bit of uh, demi glass in there, and this is basically done. Remember early on we made the beef stack? That's the reduced beef stack. Here I made with a spoon in there. That's all it gets. Right, let me explain what happens next. The beef is going to get sliced and rolled. This goes inside the beef and then it goes on top of the mushroom and it gets a little demi over it. That's why it's such a complicated recipe. That's why it's called roast beef royal. Actually means royal. So the oysters have been quickly blanched, but the oysters on the inside, you want them raw. Have some gherkins already cut. Just going to put a little bit of oil in there. We'll mix it up really good. Again, this is one of the early examples of mixing uh, seafood with meat that so many of the 18th century compadres did. Mmm, tastes good. Red beans and wine directly from Burgundy is ready. So now I'm going to serve them up and then I get ready to plate the main course. So much flavor when you eat that, it's, it's fantastic. So now I'm gonna plate the main course, and the base of it is very expensive. <laughs> the base of it is, you saw me making it, chanterelle mushroom, porcini mushroom, truffles, button mushrooms, any kind of mushrooms you wanna get in there. Just quickly saute it, a little bit of the beef stuck in there, and it's just, you wanna keep the mushrooms al dente, if you will, so that they don't become a mush. I'll tell you one thing, I never met the Honorable Bishop White, but I know he had a serious taste level. Because those some of those recipes that we found in the, in the research are just amazing. Here we go. 
as you saw me cooking this in the pot, it's very interesting. You could obviously keep it much easier and just stick it in the oven. But I think it's a certain amount of drama to it when you cook, like they actually cooked in the 18th century. And just to let you know, this recipe I got out of uh, Hannah Glass's book. <laughs> and Hannah Glass, for some odd reason, she, uh, I mean, she, she died poor, I can wonder why. Truffles, porcini, all this good stuff. <laughs> huh? What do you think about that? Boy, I tell you. Bishop White definitely had a remarkable taste. And I know he drove fantastic dinner parties. He had uh, many, many important people in Philadelphia in his house all the time. The meat is ready cooked. I'm gonna let it sit up for a little bit. As you know, anytime you roast something, you wanna have it rest for a bit. Not a long rest, but a bit of a rest. Ideally, you wanna let it rest this roast for about maybe 50 to 20 minutes, like with any roast you wanna do. Now I'm gonna do, I'm gonna slice three, four slices thin, roll the stuffing into it, place it on top of the mushroom, top it off middle demi, and dinner is served for Mr. Bishop White. Mmm. It's just amazing how properly I get the temperature down. Am I good? So now I'm gonna put the the filling in it. I'm sometimes intrigued when I read some of those recipes and I figure who had the time to come up with it, or better even, who could afterwards do it, because there was a lot of salt given to it. So now I'm just rolling that like so. It's gonna do a very little ripping. I'm sure if I had cooked this meal for Bishop White, I would sit right on front in the congregation versus in the back, where most chefs had their place, unfortunately. Just kidding. <laughs> but I am just reminded to see how well the 18th century people did enjoy great cuisine. This is a fantastic meal. I'm always amazed when I make dishes like that, the sophistication that the 18th century chefs brought to the table. Just would have thought about all the different steps. Obviously, they had a lot of people working in the kitchen, but still, just amazing, just absolutely amazing. As you know, I'm from Europe. Brains was a stable where I came from in the Black Forest. I left a long time ago, so I don't get to eat brains very often, so I don't want to miss the opportunity today to dig in. Oh. So beautiful, so much taste of history.